Welcome back to the Anti Meta Meta Club. This week we are at Mount Panorama Bathurst, essentially a hill climb and a downhill on the same track. We've got Group 4, and the Group 4 bop is looking pretty good. However, there's a clear meta for time trial and also a clear meta for the race pace itself. Let's get into it. This week's Anti Meta car is the Aston Martin V8 Vantage. The torquey V8 gives it enough power to short shift and save a ton of fuel while not losing any speed. It also handles incredibly well, and as you can see from this clip, it's fast enough to pass the S15 Silvia on the straight. Our friend Damien, who actually discovered that the V8 Vantage was going to be our Anti Meta car of the week, is in first place with the S15. I managed 19th as of last night with a 210.5. The S15 is faster in time trial, however, if you try to short shift with it, it really loses out because all of its power is in the high rev range. The Ferrari, however, can short shift and not lose any pace. Starting off way on the right, after the 100 meter board, we're going to look for this convenient light post on the right. Brake hard right before you get to it, and as soon as you pass the 50 meter board is when we're going to turn in. Get to second gear and get on the throttle as early as you possibly can. We're trying to extend this straight as much as we can. Note how wide I go on the exit. You want to use as much of that outside curb as you possibly can and try not to slide those tires. This is probably the most important single corner because it is not only a really long straight, but it's also uphill. If you mess that up, it's going to cost a lot of time. Before we get there, I want to say I'm embarrassed by the next corner, but the lap was pretty good, so I kept it anyways. Essentially, you want to do the same thing I'm about to do, but earlier. In between this access road on the left and the 50 meter board is where you want to start braking. Definitely clear of the 50 meter board. Due to the camber of the track on the inside of the corner, you actually want to turn in a little bit earlier than you usually would for a corner of this shape, but I turned in late, unfortunately. This probably cost me more than a tenth, so you can definitely do that a lot better. You want to get on the throttle early, but I think it's more important to keep your momentum through this since it's still uphill. Be careful if you do go over this curb, it can send you into the wall or even send you sideways. As soon as you get to the right, start eyeballing this first little bend in the wall, and as soon as we get past it, that's when we're going to start braking. I'm actually treating this like one big corner, so I don't go full brake at any time because I'm constantly turning in just a little bit. We get down to second gear, and we want to get on the throttle hard, but we don't want to get on the throttle too hard or turn too much because if you slide out going uphill, you lose way too much momentum. Stay tight on this right-hander and immediately track out to the wall on the left. Hug this wall as soon as you can, and when you get to this tree right here, you're going to start turning in. You do not need to lift here as long as you apex late enough on this corner on the right. If you're too late or too early, it can easily send you into the wall on the left, so be very careful of that. It's probably going to take a few tries. As you set up for the next corner, I want you to stay mid-track. I actually aim for that tree. If you're too wide going over this crest, the tires will lose grip and you will go into that wall. It's important to treat this as a single corner. Don't straighten out the wheel in between these two corners. Transferring the weight to neutrality and then back into a corner takes way too long and you'll just end up missing the apex. You want to lift a bit more than I did because I actually hit the wall here. Luckily it was just a scrape and it didn't cost me too much time. Some people completely avoid this curb on the right here, which is smart, honestly. I like to use it, but I make sure I lift off the throttle before I hit it so the car can continue turning in. You want to get as close to this wall as you possibly can. You can get a little bit closer than that, but if you hit it, you will go off into the gravel. Get as close to the wall on the left as you possibly can, and as we go under the sign, we're going to lift to make sure we get as close to the wall on the right. Pay close attention to how much I'm braking. If you brake too much and turn the wheel at all, since we're going downhill, it can really make your car turn around really quickly. So be very careful on the brakes, but make sure you don't come off them too much either, because that can carry your car way off the line. Downshift to fourth and use as much of this curb as you possibly can, continuing to turn once you get past the end of the curb. Downshift to third and brake hard, hugging this corner here on the right. Staying in third can help keep your momentum through this sequence. Balance the car with the throttle, and when you see the yellow barrier on the right, we're going to turn in sharply, making sure we don't go over this white line, but using as much of it as you possibly can. Back on the throttle as soon as your car drops, and we're going to try to go straight to this outside wall on the left, obviously avoiding both of those walls. The next two corners, we're not going to really set up wide for either of them. First, we're going to hug this one on the left, and as we approach the next one, we go a little bit wide, but we're still going to turn in pretty early and lift off the throttle to hug the inside. Brake as soon as you see the falcon sign in the distance, and we're going to aim just to the right of it. You want to apex late because it is essentially a hairpin, but not going too wide is really important because it will just cost you time. 
Keep your eye on the inside wall. As soon as that tall part disappears, that's when we're getting on the throttle and we want to get on it hard and soon. If you're too hard, obviously you can slide and that's never going to be good. And if you hit either of those walls, it's going to completely ruin this really long straight, which obviously isn't going to be optimal. This is the most common place for overtaking on the track, at least it has been so far for this week's races. On the right, you can sometimes see a kangaroo making laps on that field. And there's also a family of kangaroos on the left. Fun fact. The pavement on the left can help you really angle yourself and get yourself straight for the next breaking point. After the 150 meter board, right where it says sign on the right is when we're going to brake. Brake in a straight line all the way down to third gear and after you pass the 50 meter board is when you're going to start turning in. If you do hit this curb, it's not the end of the world. Make sure you continue turning left as you get on the throttle, making sure you also don't slide the car out. Try to just correct it if you do because it's important to get on that throttle really early. You also want to be careful not to go over that curb because if you touch the grass, your lap is pretty much over. Our final breaking point is the end of the red and white paint on the left. I personally don't like using the curbing on the inside because it's really tall and it can either delay the amount of time it takes you to get on the throttle or it can just bounce you directly off the track. Carefully exit in second, making sure you don't slide because if you slide even a little bit when you hit that outside curb, it can really turn you around or put you in the wall on the left. All right, let's see that whole thing in full speed now. Looking for the 50 meter board on the right, we're gonna break the light post before it. We want to get on that throttle as early as we possibly can, which I always say when it comes to these straights. It's always true, but we really want to focus on that because it's an uphill straight and it's really long. So anything you do to mess up that first corner is going to really, really hurt your lap. Like you saw before, I really messed up this next corner as well. You want to turn in a little bit earlier. In fact, you want to turn in earlier than you usually would for a corner of this shape because the camber is really nice on the inside of that corner. I do suggest focusing on maintaining momentum above all for that corner though. Stay close to this kink and treat this as a decreasing radius corner rather than two corners. Don't get on the throttle too heavily there because if you slide at all you're going to lose all your momentum. Look for this tree on the left because that is your turn in point. Do not lift here. Any loss of momentum up the hill is going to be really bad. Stay middle track here, aim for that tree in the distance and lift off more than I did so you don't scrape this wall. You can actually damage your car or get a penalty. You might want to avoid that curb on the outside, but it's up to you. Maintaining your rhythm, following your line, and avoiding sliding is really key to this whole downhill section. The margin for error here is really tight, and one of the coolest things about Gran Turismo is that you can do just the sectors, you can do just this section by itself in the circuit experience, so you don't have to wait the entire time to get there, and then if you mess it up, you don't have to drive all the way back around the track to try it again. Hopefully you avoided any contact with the walls on that last corner because that will completely ruin your exit onto the straight, which is, again, very important like all straights are on any racetrack. Using the extra asphalt on the left here can allow you to get a much better angle so your car is settled and straight going into the next braking zone. This next sequence is really deceptively tricky. You're going really, really fast, so it's actually easy to slide the car out, much easier than it seems because it's not a super tight corner, so be really careful on the throttle. As I said in the breakdown, I really like to avoid the inside curve because it can do a lot of things to your car that you don't like. It can make your car bounce, it can push you off your line, and it can also delay your throttle input. All right, that was tough. Let's watch a race. Since I wasn't able to get a good race during my Monday stream, I had to travel overseas to get a race with anyone that was any kind of competitive. You may recognize a few of those names, and what's really cool to see is that pretty much everyone was in either the Silvia or the Ferrari. There were a few exceptions, obviously, but the vast majority of the field was in one of the two meta cars. It was cool to see my buddy Jack in the same car that I was in, though. So before we get in the race, I want to talk about the actual race strategy and the best way to save fuel. It's no longer much of a secret that the fuel map does not work nearly as efficiently as just short shifting. However, I like to put the fuel map into six as the race is starting because it can save maybe a percent and that one percent could be the difference between a position and not. One of the very best ways you can ensure that you have enough fuel for the entire race is to pay attention to what percentage of fuel you have at the beginning of the race, choose a specific point on the digital tack to shift at, and just maintain that throughout the entire first lap. It can be really easy then to just adjust based on how much fuel you used for that first lap. If you use too much, you can just move your shift point back just a little bit 
and if you didn't use quite enough and you had a surplus, you can either just choose to keep that surplus or you can shift a little bit higher and then you'll find yourself with a little bit more speed. I've been doing this race all day, so I was really familiar with how much fuel this car was going to burn and how much I could use. And what I really like to do with racing from the back is use up a whole bunch of fuel at the beginning because it's really easy to save when you're following behind people. Now, it's cool because I've talked to Jack before about just letting me buy in a situation, but I did have a run on him. And if you let someone buy and they have good pace, then you can actually use them and use their slipstream to your advantage and save more fuel than they're saving while going about the same pace. And I think you'll see that that's pretty much what Jack did. He was able to follow me through most of the pack. and It was actually really cool to see. Like I was saying before, I use up a lot of fuel at the beginning because there are going to be a lot of times right now, for instance, where I can just use the slipstream behind someone to carry me through and with less air resistance, I can shift a lot earlier and keep up the same amount of speed. If you really, really want to maximize the amount of fuel that you have or the amount of fuel that you're saving, you can use a different fuel map when you're following behind people or you can use a different fuel map in downhill sections or during curves when it's not really important to get the maximum amount of power out of a car. It's also really important to know about your opponent's cars. That S15 Sylvia, as we know, is the qualifying lap champion. However, as I discussed earlier, it cannot save fuel nearly as well as the Vantage. So he'd have to use way more fuel to keep up with me or to defend against me than I had to use to get in front of him. Final fuel saving tip that's on my mind. As the race goes and you're depleting fuel, you're going to be losing weight and the less your car weighs, the less fuel it's going to use. So you're going to end up using more fuel doing the exact same things for the first few laps of the race than you will for the last few laps of the race. For instance, if I were to shift at 50% of the bar for the first four laps, I would end up using less doing the exact same for the second four laps of the race. Now, at the beginning of the second lap of the race, I found myself behind three Ferraris who I didn't know if they were going to be working together or not. It looked like these two were going to be battling, so I figured that would be an opportunity for me to make some kind of move. It is incredibly difficult to make an outside pass on this first corner. However, going for it and putting your car in that position, forcing the inside car to defend will compromise their exit. So even if you can't make a move stick right there, you're going to slow them down enough to stay close so you can strike later on. I think I talk about this quite a lot, but when it comes to following people through complex curbs, that's a lot of opportunities for people to make a mistake. And if you're really close to someone, you're going to get caught up immediately and you're not going to have time to react. So even if you can follow and stay on their bumper, it's probably a smart move to give them a lot of space. Because especially in close quarters when there are this many cars on track, mistakes can and will happen and you want to give yourself time to react. I, however, don't always follow my own advice. I do try to make sure that I do whatever I can to protect myself though, which sometimes involves just going off the line so if someone makes a mistake, you can put yourself in a safer position just like that. With things getting really bunched up here, I went for a move right there, but it was slightly too late and I went into the back of that guy. Luckily, neither of us crashed because of it and he gave me space here. With the S15 hot on our tails, I decided to get right back in the slipstream of Andrew because, again, I knew that he'd have to use way more fuel than I would have to in order to keep up the pace with the Ferraris. I didn't realize that he had a penalty there, so we ended up being really safe. And if you look just a little bit behind, you can see our buddy Jack is still there. The end of the lap and the beginning of the next lap are both really high speed sections, so it's a really good opportunity to just save some fuel but I didn't really know what their pace was gonna be like, so I decided to continue being aggressive and I wanted to test Andrew here. I put myself in a position to go for a pass if the opportunity arose and it didn't, so I just made sure I braked early enough that I wouldn't run into him and ruin his line and then slotted right back behind them. One really interesting thing that Cantilever actually told me when we were streaming, he knows that I struggle a lot with the math when it comes to fuel calculations. For whatever reason, math just doesn't work out in my head. So if you just note that you want to have 75%, 50%, and 25% at lap 2, 4, and 6, then it's a really easy way to make sure that you have enough fuel. Anyways, I capitalized on Andrew making that mistake on T1, and then he tried to push Rory so that he could possibly sneak behind him, but I was still able to take that position for him. And so we got behind Rory and our goal was just to follow him as long as we could until an opportunity arose. 
The previous lap was a lot more dangerous because there were three Ferraris and then I was following really closely to them. If any of them made a mistake, it could take out all of us. It's still risky if you follow too close to even just one person, but it is just a third of the danger. When I was next to Andrew on the lap before, and then when he was really close behind me on that previous corner, I realized that Andrew was definitely going to be a clean driver, so it gave me a lot of confidence in this next section that I didn't have to worry too much about what he was going to do. I could just focus ahead and try to make the overtake. On one hand, you want to be careful because if someone goes off, they can collect you, but on the other hand, if someone makes a mistake, it's a really good opportunity to capitalize on it. And since he went wide on both of those two corners, I knew that I could position myself on the inside there and go for a move. I left him space, braked just in time, missed the apex, but we all stayed clean and I was able to stay all the way in front. The Ferrari is really good on saving fuel and maintaining pace, as I've said many times in this video, so I wanted to use as much fuel as I possibly could get away with so I could get away from him, essentially. I was unfortunately in the very worst part of the track to now be in front, though because with the long straights, the Ferrari being really efficient with the fuel, he was going to be able to go really fast, use my slipstream, and potentially make a move before the really complicated uphill and then downhill sections. Even with the extra fuel I'd been using for pretty much the entirety of the last lap, I knew that I'd still be able to save on the downhill section a lot, and if I could catch the person in front, then that would be another opportunity to use their slipstream to save even more fuel. I also still had the distinct advantage of being far enough in front that if he was able to catch up to me on this next straight, then I can move to the inside and it would be nearly impossible for him to make a move on the outside of corner two. As I cleared that corner, I realized that he had made a pretty big mistake, so I continued using a little bit more fuel than I would have if I were saving fuel, and I maintained this inside position for the next corner just in case he was able to get up next to me so he wouldn't be able to make a move. I was luckily clear of him here, and then this happened. Right there, that little mistake he made pretty much guaranteed that I'd be able to keep this position. Jumping forward more than a full lap ahead, I saw that Jules had gone off in the sand, and I didn't know if that was because of what happened between him and Lenny Boy. Now, I had raced Jules in the last race that I had done, and he was very clean. I really appreciated racing him. I, however, did not know who Lenny Boy was, and it did look like those two were side by side before Jules went off in the dirt, so mental note, be careful of Lenny. I want to make it clear that I'm not accusing Lenny. But I do think it's really important that if you know that one driver is really clean and they just had a battle with someone and ended up off the track, of course they could have just made a mistake, but it could also mean the other person's dirty. Like I said just a second ago, I'm not accusing Lenny of anything. I had no clue. And the really important thing to focus on is that you just don't know. When it comes to a new person, someone that you're not used to driving against, it's really important to try not to pass on the outside. If you pass someone on the outside, it's really easy for them just to nudge you off, and then there's not much you can do. Very shortly after that free position from Jules, we got a free position from Gabri right there. Again, I do not blame Lenny for what happened between him and Jules. It might have not even been between him and Jules. They might not have actually been battling whatsoever, but I always treat anyone that I don't know with extreme caution, and if there's even a hint of a reason to think that they might have been responsible for someone else going off, then it's really just the smart thing to do to be really cautious with that person. Anyways, I'm still going to give him the benefit of the doubt, but what I'm not going to do is try to pass him on the outside. I thought I was actually going to be able to get in front of him here. He might have used a lot of extra fuel running away from me, especially considering I was purple right there, but either way. We're still just going to try to stay close to him and make a move whenever we can. Like I said before, I know I'm a broken record sometimes, but staying too close to people can be really dangerous because if they make a mistake, they can collect you. And that almost happened here. As we snuck by, he got a little bit of oversteer and that led him to hitting us just a little bit. It wasn't bad and it definitely wasn't on purpose. And you can see that he had an opportunity to put me in the wall and he didn't. So again, for like the 15th time, not blaming him for what happened to Jules, but it's always really smart just to be extra cautious. And I was glad that he proved that he's not a dirty driver whatsoever. He could have put me in that wall, and he didn't. For our final time warp, we're going all the way to the end of lap seven when I finally caught up to V Nazar. If you were watching my stream on Monday, I made a huge deal over the fact that Nerd Strength wanted me to drive the Porsche, and it ended up the Porsche was really fantastic here. So I'm sorry, Nerd Strength. I owe you an apology. I was also really happy to hit a 2 minute and 12 second lap. That felt really good. 
I had spent the entirety of the last lap just trying to catch up to him by this specific point, and I thought that my plan was working perfectly, but nope, the Porsche surprised me, and he must have had some extra fuel because I couldn't even close in on him. This ended up being a fantastic battle, and I'm really glad that I got to capture this. As is the very smartest possible move, he defended the inside, and of course it's my duty to then go on the outside just to make sure that he has to compromise his exit there. It's really important to try to do that because if you can get them just to slow down, then you can stay close enough and potentially strike later on. Now the Porsche is known for handling really well, and he definitely knew how to drive that thing. Since he demonstrated that he definitely knows what he's doing, I decided it was probably safe enough for me to stay as close to him as I possibly could because the chance of him making a big mistake were probably slim. And if he did make some kind of big mistake, I thought it would be really worth it just getting this really good battle in. I think it might have been a connection thing, but it might have actually been a technique to scrape on that wall a little bit just to scrub off enough speed and get yourself a really wide angle to get a lot of speed into that next corner. He was definitely fast on the downhill, and it took everything I could just to keep up with him, and he made a tiny bit of a mistake right there, so I was able to stay really close. One of the most important things I learned from SB Mind when it comes to toge racing is to take a different line on a hairpin because it's really hard to get the timing right. If they slow down before you're ready to, then it can really ruin your momentum and compromise your exit. Obviously, you can just run into them too, and you want to avoid that at all costs. If you're able to in any fuel saving race, it's important to have a surplus so you can go 100% at the end of the race if you need to pass someone, and it looks like we both did that. I was again really surprised by how fast the Porsche was, but I thought I could be brave on the brakes and get in front here. Nope. He did really well. I gave him space because everyone deserves space, and he did the same to me, which made it just an absolute pleasure to race with him. I thought surely I was going to lose out here, so again, brave on the brakes, making sure that he'd had enough space, and I wasn't quite sure at the beginning if I did give him enough space. After watching the replay, it turns out I did. He had just made a bit of a mistake and gone entirely off on his own, and we talked to each other after the race. It was really fun. I really enjoyed the battle with that guy, and I was really happy to finish fifth and with the fastest lap in a 12. This ended up being probably my favorite race that I've done for this series so far and I, I just absolutely love racing in Bathurst. Once again, I wanna thank you so much for watching my video. If you liked what you saw, please don't forget to like and subscribe because I'll be making a new video every single week. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comments below and I'll see you next time when we fight the meta.